Welcome to Quark Talk. I'm Crystal here. It's Tuesday morning. We're going to talk about something quite spiritual. But I don't know how spiritual you are or where you sit on this uh, world of religion. But you know, everybody has their beliefs. And I want to pinpoint some concept of celibacy in religion. Because why? Why is it that the church and why is it that so many religions are male dominated? Um, there are a couple that aren't. I'm not trying to be a woman's rights advocate for the church right now, but it's an interesting topic on why the importance of celibacy and why men dominate it. I've got two really interesting men here today. And they're like, why are we, why are we here? We should be, you know, <laughs> but you will find out soon enough. Let me introduce them and uh, it will explain itself. I've got two very, so now they, they wear very different hats, but today I'm going to put one on them more specifically than the others. Um, next to me is the lovely Greg Kinkley, who, is, why don't you introduce yourself? You've got so many hats that I don't feel I do justice to. Well, I'm uh, a Deputy uh, Attorney General for the State of Hawaii. I thought you said you were going to say that. <laughs> you see? Yeah, I'm just doing he exposed it himself already. Full disclosure. Right. Oh, Full oh disclosure. you're in trouble now. But nothing that I say has anything to do with state policy. Okay, can you write that in? Yes, <laughs> I will. Right. Um, yeah. I'm also a lay leader uh, for services in the Conservative Temple here uh -huh. at, uh, in Oahu, uh, Congregation Sof Marav. Okay. I teach Talmud on the side. Very interesting. Okay, worldly man. Roy, <laughs> this is Roy Chu. And I am Roy Chu. I'm a co-founder of Island Film Group, which is a local production and financing company for film, television, and commercials. But I think the background of my life that's relevant today, to, to today's topic is that I was a lector in a Catholic church locally for about 10 years, and I served on that church's pastoral council for about three or four years. Mm. Um, and so I've grown up as a Catholic and was raised that way. But nowadays, I tend to focus more on spirituality than religion. So that hopefully will be relevant to the topic. Oh, absolutely. Why don't we start with that? What is the difference between spirituality and religion for a lot of people? In my mind, spirituality deals with your relationship with God, whereas religion incorporates the doctrine of the church that you belong to or follow. And um, so religious doctrine is something that has been ingrained in me since I was very young. And thinking about today's topic, it made me think that for a lot of uh, people who grew up in a certain religion because their parents kind of yes. put them into that church, they didn't really question what they were taught. They were just told to believe that what they were taught was true. Right. And in my case, I just reached the point in my youth when I was 15, 16, when I started to ask questions about religion and I wasn't getting the answers that were satisfying me in order for me to continue following uh, the religion of Catholicism strictly as it was meant to be. And so I found myself kind of drifting more towards a liberal version of Catholicism, if you will. And so I, and I think the most essential aspect of Christianity and even Catholicism is compassion. Okay. If you are compassionate to your fellow human being, you are living a Christian life. And so whether or not you believe whether Jesus turned um, you know, water into wine or whether he walked on water, all those things are interesting, but to me they're not really relevant to my faith, my relationship with God. Okay. What's important to me is expressing and acting out in compassion towards your fellow human, uh, man mankind. So quickly, what is your take on celibacy in the church? Before so it's interesting, I did a little bit of research, and actually in the first three centuries of Catholicism, um, celibacy was not a doctrine exactly. or a requirement. The priests were married, right? Yeah. In fact, one of the apostles had a wife, and the That's Bible right. refers to the apostles and their wives. And it wasn't until like 11, in the 1136 time frame when the church put into place this rule that priests had to be hmm. uh, celibate. Um, uh, and it's interesting, over time, if we jump forward actually to modern day, there are uh, even the Catholic Church has been open to certain Christians from other churches joining the Catholic Church if they want to because, and there's one example of a, a Christian church, I can't remember the name of it, but certain priests felt like the church was getting too liberal and they, they were wanted to stay more conservative. The Catholic Church kind of opened its doors to them joining, oh. but some of these men were married. And okay. the Catholic Church is willing to make an exception for them. But so if you were married before you switched over, it was okay. Right. And that seems to be the way it goes even for the other exceptions that the Catholic Church makes. For example, deacons uh, uh, can be married and join the Catholic Church and perform uh, weddings and funerals right. and other right. Catholic rituals. What they can't do is give communion. 
Okay. Which is the, oh, so that's a very the host, specific, right? The, because the that of, represents the, the purity of, of the bread of life. Right. right. Going mm. back to clarify that, that if um, previously married um, uh, priests were allowed to change over, going back to the topic of celibacy, does that mean that because they're married, they can continue having sex? But if you didn't get in before you were technically married, <laughs> you, you're not allowed. Okay, Greg, let's hear you, you talk about this. Well, of course, Judaism takes a completely yes. different... And I want to say rabbis are, allow women, so it's a really interesting contrast. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> somewhat ironically, when you mentioned 1136, that's just about the time the Jews came out with the ed edict that you can't be married to more than one woman. Mm. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> well, then, that's better, right? Because it's still in the Torah. Uh, maybe I have to lay a little bit of foundation here. The, the Jewish approach to faith yes. begins with the doctrine of the Torah containing all of the laws that we follow. The Torah is the first five books of what Roy would call the Old Testament. Correct. Okay, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We look at that not so much as a book, as more of a law book that is told through stories of a very dysfunctional family. Hmm. So by having the context of this family with all these beefs, you know, people getting beat up on each other, taking each other's heritage and stuff, we have found 613 laws in the Torah. None of them say anything about not getting married or remaining celibate. So hmm. the Occam's razor is if it's not in there, we don't. We don't do that. But I understand that they kind of created this celibacy rule because of the land owning years ago when they had the priests who had wanted yes. to have claim. Is that right? That, that is an often repeated sociological and political explanation for the Christian experience. There's nothing like that in Judaism. I actually have not heard that. And oh, yeah, for no, the Christian no. side, hmm. it's always been that celibacy is a necessary part of a priest's way of life in order to more fully hmm. ex to reflect the fact that he's so devoted mm -hmm. to Jesus. Um, right. And the whole point really is to kind of uh, mimic the life of Jesus. And the assumption there is that Jesus himself was celibate, which, right. which I don't know if was that's Jesus true Was he a virgin? Or not. Tell yes, me, was right. he a virgin? Well, I can tell you that because he was a Jewish boy. But first, <laughs> <laughs> actually, this point of Roy's is, is, is maybe the fulcrum. It, it's the, the actual place where we need to bifurcate the two faiths. Okay. Um, and it has to do with priesthood. Because okay. after all, the priesthood from the Catholic Church came from the understanding of priesthood in, in Judaism. The thing is, though, that there's something revolutionary in Judaism that for some reason everything went backwards rather than forwards uh, still from is a right political now. point of view. If you look at the book of Leviticus, uh, children in school learn Leviticus first, actually in Hebrew school. Okay. And everyone wonders, oh, why do you do that? That's the most boring thing there <laughs> is, right? It's like, oh, put in this much but cinnamon and right. this much acacia and burn it here. But the point is, it was a revolutionary book because inside that superficially boring thing, were all of the instructions for how to make uh, sacrifices, what the ingredients were for the holy incense, etc. Okay. And since there's universal, the concept of universal education and literacy was always key, what this meant was the priesthood was opening up all the secrets of the priest to every Jew. So there was never any differentiation in terms of understanding or lifestyle between priests and mm. the regular practicing Jews. So the idea of celibacy uh, being foisted upon the priests in order to bring them closer has nothing at all to do with Judaism. We, we dealt with Tahor okay. and Tameh instead, mm. uh, ritual purity and ritual But memory. you do mention sacrifice. I want to mm. go back to that between the different religions mm. and what that means in terms of um, depriving oneself of, of of a natural expression, the sexuality. Mm. As certainly, men, how do you feel about that? Certainly that is one of the criticisms uh, of, of the celibacy rule. Okay. Uh, when Greg was talking, I was thinking too that the whole point of, well, what I gathered from what he was saying was that in the Jewish faith, the secrets, so, so to speak, are available to both priests and the regular people. So there's no mystery, there's no secret sauce in terms of having access <laughs> to true faith. And I think that's another criticism of the celibacy rule is that, you know, how can a family go to a priest who's never been married for counseling about marital issues? It just doesn't make sense to me. And so somebody who's married would seem to be better qualified to talk to a young couple about marital issues, family issues, because he's lived it. Yeah. But somebody who has never, and just because he has a closer relationship to God, which theoretically might sound great, but practically, 
it doesn't really help in terms of advising a couple about about marital issues, about family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's another reason why I just don't think the celibacy rule makes sense. I also find that the biggest contradiction is that the act of lovemaking, the act of sex, is for procreation. And that isn't that the essence of the Bible, is it's, to create it's, life? It's I don't know. It's the first commandment. The first commandment in the Torah is pru rvu, be fruitful and multiply. So we would actually see celibacy as a sin because it's taking you huh. off the road of the Torah. Celibacy has, in fact, resulted in sin, but when you look at all the, you know, the priest molestation cases, oh, and, God, right. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you feel for them in a way because the, the rules that they're confined to live by yes. prevent their natural expression, and it's coming out in these ways which are harming <coughs> other people. Mm -hmm. So is it not natural for men to deprive themselves of sex? I think it is not natural to deprive them of the natural urge to have sex, yes. Right. And it's interesting because the word celibacy, when I was doing my research, doesn't necessarily mean abstaining from sex. It just right. means being not married. Right. Right. So you can be not married and have sexual relations, <laughs> and then you're loophole, celibate. Right? That's right. Right, legal gays? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I, it makes me think that maybe, at least in the historical past, when the rule was in effect at that time, that they were able to abide by it because it didn't mean abstaining from sex. It just meant abstaining from marriage. Mm -hmm. right. And maybe those priests... Of course, that too was subject to the Jewish interpretation because the primitive Christians were Jews. So when they look at celibacy, which means kolen liba, right, living alone, a man couldn't live alone with a woman under Jewish law unless there was intercourse. So that was just understood. <laughs> that was understood, mm -hmm. right? But then it developed over time. So what about something like masturbation? Because even in the church, that's mm -hmm. highly, highly evil and shunned on. And I don't yet, know why. Why? Right. Okay, so let's talk I haven't about research, that. I haven't researched where in the Bible it says that, but, mm. um, you know, the only downside from a spiritual aspect is that you are now not using that seed in order to promulgate your right, race to have children. Right. So it's a waste of energy or a waste of <laughs> your, your spirit, maybe. Not, <laughs> not, not to speak for Christians, but I thought the, the idea from the Catholic point of view is that might have been Messiah there that just went up. Oh. Right? So, I, right? yeah. so that, that's the assumption that each sperm is carrying an individual identity. And there that raises <laughs> another question of when does that identity actually come into being? Oh, is it after oh yeah. the connection between sperm and egg? Yes. Or is it before? And mm. I kind of think it's after, but I have no proof. Mm. That's just my own view. So what's your take on abortion then? Mm. Abortion is a very difficult subject because I grew up obviously with the you know, Christian, Catholic right, way of thinking. Enough. And whenever you have any joining of sperm and egg, it, it makes me question at what point does life begin? Huh. And I think that's, you know, if you were to, if life begins at that moment and you're killing that life, then is that murder? Um, and of course, in Roe v. Wade, you know, they actually went through, um, Justice Blackmun went through and the other justices who, who agreed with the decision, went through the trimesters and tried to analyze when a fetus is viable. And that's a whole other way to approach it. But from a religious standpoint, I can certainly understand the people who are, um, you know, who believe that life begins at the moment of, of of the union between sperm and egg. Mm. Mm. It's a difficult subject. Uh, I know, it's a I, difficult know. I didn't subject. want to throw that on you, yeah. but great. Well, yes, in the, in the, there's some light given to this in the Talmud. Again, I can't speak even for all Jews, let alone old men, but um, <laughs> there is a biblical verse um, that has to do with tort law when it comes into the Talmud about two men fighting each other. And then a pregnant woman comes along and one of them accidentally hits her and causes her to miscarry. Mm. There are monetary damages given to the husband of the pregnant woman. Now, quite irrespective of what you might think of all these other things, because yes, women were chattel back then in every religion, unfortunately, it shows that they were reducing it to a property claim. So that means it wasn't considered life at the moment, because mm. it would be capital if they'd lost a life. I mean, that's the inference anyway. Well, that's why we have kids though, right? It's all for investments of somebody mm. to take care of us in the end. It's all a big investment. <laughs> but but is that, well. does that mean that life only begins after birth? based on what you based on that example. That's a reasonable inference. Are you looking to get shrunk? Join us on Shrink Wrap Hawaii. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I see couples, individuals, families, because you know why? Because we all have problems. And if you're curious about shrinks and what they talk about, come look at my show, Shrink Wrap Hawaii, and maybe you'll find your shrink. Aloha Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. 
We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. And we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. You know, it's the same. Back here on Fox Talk, talking to two very interesting uh, men about a celibacy in religion. Now, this is a huge topic, but we're going to just try to open it up a little bit and see what interesting things come out of it. We're talking and arg we're not only arguing, but we have different views on, on celibacy, on masturbation, on, on whether women should be um, allowed to take part in, in, in the church. And um, I want to recap that celibacy, this, this issue. Um, there, are, you know, there are websites on, on promoting celibacy and, and what's the benefit of it? Well, you know, on a... Um, I guess physical level, they think that you know you're going to protect yourself and you're going to wait till the true love comes for you, not for your, um, not for your body, but for your yourself. Um, it's a sense of empowerment and self worth. So there are a lot of ways that people can convince you that this is the way to go to keep yourself clean and, and pure. So going back to this, how do you feel about that and how your religion kind of um, takes on that concept of purity? Well. Yeah, something that at least is translated as purity is something very central to Judaism. Okay. In, indeed, one might say that Judaism is based on a very bifurcated form of discrimination. Discrimination <laughs> between holy and not holy. Right. So not holy doesn't mean profane, although it's often uh, translated that way. But that's what the church tends to do, right? It's the right or wrong. It's yes, the evil. complication is when it, that got transferred into Christianity, it, it got twisted a little bit from the Jewish point of view. First of all, there's another challenge we, we need to start with. The forebear of both Judaism and Christianity was a Judaism that was a temple cult, and they sacrificed, you know, it was a, like a Big Mac all the time, right? They had a huge barbecue right there in Jerusalem all day. That got stopped by the Romans. Mm -hmm. So Judaism either had to morph and change physically, maybe even emotionally what it was, or give up. And what we did is we changed. We started to offer prayers instead of sacrifices. Hmm. But we needed to keep the concept of holy and not holy. The twist with Christianity is because you have their priestly cl class, which is seen as an intercessor. They're somehow, I think you even use the word, closer to God, as it were. Hmm. This is a concept that would be totally foreign to, to a Jew. Uh, our God is everywhere and nowhere at once, not right. in anything, yet in everything, okay. as it were. So we all have our chance to, to be together and to be with the one. Okay. So the purity as a religious concept is no longer really viable on a day-to-day -day basis. But why is it that women, on, in the general sense of world religions, mm. tends to be kind of an outcast uh, are they uh, not deemed pure enough uh, well that, to represent that, the church or that the, is a point. The there is this concept of nidda, the menstruant woman, right? Right. So even have, in the Jewish studies, yes, heavily. Um, among the Orthodox, uh, certainly, uh, and any practicing observant Jew, you're forbidden to have intercourse with your wife during a seven-day period either side of the menstruation. That's because it's tied to the blood, which was seen as the essence of life itself. And again, this is a matter of holiness. It wasn't that it was unclean that term really has no purchase. It's that it was so suffused with this concept of holiness because that's life itself. There are many times in the Torah it says, for the blood is the life. You, you can't eat blood, right, because blood is the life. Mm. So, What's your take on that? In the Catholic faith, we actually, um, growing up at least, my understanding was that we celebrate women because, you know, the mother of Jesus has a very mm. revered place in, in Christian doctrine. Um, there's a... a you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God prayer that, yeah, that celebrates her. Mm -hmm. Prays for, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. And that prayer along with the Lord's Prayer are often said together. I know I say it together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've always thought that women were celebrated. Um, but I, as I a maternal figure, but not as a leader. So do you see, like, in, if you look at how um, we're all educated and boiled down to how this patriarchal kind of society kind of stems from this whole Agreed. church concept. Agree. And I, I see no reason why women cannot be priests and popes even in the Catholic Church. I, seen, okay. I see no reason. Why? Why should there be any difference between men and women in terms of being able to act as an intercessor 
uh, you know, a bridge between the people and God. So you are very liberal. And um, going feeding on that is how do you feel? Do you think the Pope's on the right path to say that we should be considering married men? So this kind of gets to what uh, I heard Greg talk about in the Jewish faith, where you know it, you kind of take out the mystery between the the, the, the rabbis and the people. Um, I think that you know the notion of we have to change or die is very applicable in the Catholic Church. And there is even a book that I have called Why the Catholic Church Must Change or Die. Um, and I think that Pope Francis is kind of starting that process of showing that the Catholic faith can change. He's initiating changes. Yeah. He's the one who even said that unmarried priests, right. uh, sorry, that married priests uh, may be able to serve, although he tried to couch it. I think to satisfy the conservative priests in the outlying areas where there is a shortage of priests. Well, and that's there's the a shortage thing. worldwide. Do you think it's kind of a business motivation behind this whole, um, you know, instigation? Maybe. I mean, in his mind, I like to ascribe a more, um, you know, uh, altruistic uh, motivation. <laughs> you want to I think that. he's a generally more liberal <laughs> person. And I think his leadership, I think, is helping a lot of people who are disenchanted with the Catholic faith, like myself, to maybe reconsider it and to come back into the folds of the church. Huh. I don't know where I'm going to go on that, but my own personal journey with, with God is, is a personal one. But it's nice to see that Pope Francis is, is thinking more along, along the lines that I am. Mm -hmm. So where does woman um, sit in your world of uh, not just religion, but in your life, and how maybe perhaps religion kind of morphed that concept mm -hmm. of women in your life? Mm -hmm. Well, in my own personal practice, although we're called conservative, <laughs> you, you have to know the history of the development of Judaism. So conservative is very, very liberal next to the Orthodox. Right. We, uh, the Orthodox would not allow a woman to touch the Torah, to read from the Torah, to take what we call an aliyah, where they say the blessing. Right. We do all that. They lead our services. Yes. It's a commonplace. There's no discrimination one way or the other. The idea of women in religion, though, is very complex, though, mm. because I think, I'm not sure if it's cart or horse, but the fact of the matter is women have always been subjugated and treated as chattel throughout <laughs> the generations. Religion sometimes just picked up on that or took that for granted and then maybe solidified it into a tradition. But some of the things that Judaism did even anciently that were seen as positive for women, like guaranteeing her divorce rights and a certain amount upon being divorced, those were still paternalistic, right? Yes. Those were, uh, there was nothing giving them the say and saying, okay, you go, girl. That, that's something that just doesn't happen in any religion until, I'd say, this century or mm. the beginning of the 20th century for maybe all religions. Yeah. We all have to work on it, honestly. I've, I've never heard of a rational argument as to why women cannot serve in the priesthood in the mm. Christian or Catholic <clears throat> faith, or, or in any faith for that right. matter. Um, what about even like nuns? I mean, that's just kind of like a, I guess, a category in their own uh, sense because they they uh, uphold celibacy. But does that make them more pure to do what? I mean, and how, what's their influence on the, the same, world? It's the same whether right? or not you have to use that argument for nuns as for male priests. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. they're equally invalid in my in my view. Well, there's a technical legal argument for why women shouldn't be rabbis. Okay. If by rabbi you mean someone that leads a congregation in prayer. And, and again, rabbis don't necessarily have to do that at all. Okay. But there's a technical legal reason why a woman, if you're orthodox, shouldn't lead prayer. And it has nothing to do with sex or anything else. Okay. It's that, again, we're driven by the mitzvahs, by the commandments. You can only fulfill a mitzvah if the Torah says that you're supposed to do it. Women do not have a statutory obligation to pray. Only men do. Mm. So if a woman leads a service, there are others who can't say every word in Hebrew. The way they get the benefit of that and fulfill their obligation is by saying amen at the end. That's where amen came in in, in mm. Christianity. You can't say amen to a woman because you can't fulfill an obligation through someone that doesn't have the obligation. But that mm. obligation That's is written out in what in, in the Torah, like and so everyone just upholds that? Yes, it's really developed through the Talmud, I would right. say. It's, okay. it's complex. But coming to the modern century. Right. A woman can okay. take on those mitzvahs and then she is obligated and then she can. Live. So how much is this going to or have the potential to morph? I mean, mm -hmm. look at gender issues now. You know, the concept of transgender, where does that person stand in mm -hmm. the, the voice of God or in the church or in the synagogue? Where, where do we place that? Mm -hmm. Again, I see no reason why a person's sexual orientation has anything to do with his ability to share the teachings of Christ with uh, Christians uh, or to you know perform all these ceremonies uh, to me it's totally irrelevant if yeah. they're if they are sincere in in their approach 
anyone can Roy, do it. If everybody was as liberal as you, they wouldn't have so many issues out there. I mean, come I know, on. It's like, <laughs> seriously. I know. And all the objections that I hear, to me, just don't make sense. They're all based on some notion of sexism or discrimination that was taught when they were young or, you know, that they carry. And it's an emotional, um, you know, uh, 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 stubbornness that's preventing them from being open-minded about the possibilities. And I feel like once you kind of let go of that resistance, a whole world of possibilities become, you know, visible. So you think mm -hmm. part of it is because of that um, underlying repression, if you will, that women don't feel that urge or that kind of stimulation to want to tra challenge these old traditions? I was mm -hmm. thinking about this too. When I was growing up and everything was sort of accepted in terms of how life was right. and how religion was, even the issue of women's struggles wasn't really in my face growing, growing up in Hong Kong because women, and my, my mother worked, but a lot of women didn't. They were at-home moms and so on. And they never, at least to me, objected and said, gee, I wish women had a better station in life. That yeah. didn't really happen for me in terms of my seeing it until I came to America. And then when I was mm -hmm. exposed to that and heard about it and saw about that and talked to people about it, I realized this is a very important struggle. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that it that struggle wasn't there in Asia. It's just that women are not as vocal about it, maybe because they're not as, I, I don't know why. Um, okay, but, but you brought out some very interesting comments. Unfortunately, we were running out of time. So um, again, this is an endless conversation, but I do believe that the spirituality that, that both of you have in your deep heart kind of runs through your work. I know you mm -hmm. both uh, had legal backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, Roy, you're a film producer and right. you have many, many big projects to work on and I'm sure you're gonna yes. be embedding that in there. And for Greg, obviously in your teachings yeah. and, and your linguist and your, your multi-cultural um, background, it's just fascinating that you have found a way to kind of incorporate spirituality yeah. yes. in our work whole. and life. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So um, again, find your own spirituality, I guess, if that what it Amen. is, right? Yeah. And then celibacy is just a small little kind of a thing that we <laughs> wanted to pray about to <laughs> open up this conversation. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for joining our conversation. Yeah, thank you.